Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Before we begin tonight, can I ask everyone to click on the chat icon at the top of your screen? Um, the chat icon looks, sorry, the question answer icon looks like that. Um, so, so that we have a record of your attendance, and if you could just enter your name and say hello, that means that we will know who has been able to make the event tonight, and we'll kick off in a minute or so. OK, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Obviously, this is a different way of delivering the polling station staff training that many of us have been used to in the past. But in time honoured tradition, we have arranged nice weather. However, we have used this vehicle for three by-elections that we have delivered during COVID, and it has worked well. This is a Microsoft Live, Live event, and as such, you can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. If you want to raise a question during the presentation, I'd be grateful if you could type it into the Q&A button that you used on the previous slide. That can be found at the top of the screen and it's the same icon you used to record your attendance a few minutes ago. Christine and Pam are monitoring this and will either type a response to your question or stop me so that we can deal with the question at the time. We're also recording this session for any colleagues that can't make it along tonight or if you want to play it back at a later date. Does anyone have any questions on using Teams before we move into the main presentation? OK, so welcome to this polling station staff briefing session for the Scottish Parliament elections. This is an informal session to share information relating to the election that will take place on Thursday 6th of May. It is our aim this evening to ensure that we all leave the session with a shared understanding of the key processes and rules surrounding the election. So thank you once again for joining us for this online training session. Before I begin tonight, this is a point in the evening where I would normally ask that if you've been involved in any campaigning in this election, then we would look away and allow you to slip out quietly. However, given that we're all online and most likely you're in your own houses, that's probably not reasonable. Therefore, if this does apply, then please leave the session and contact us later. The integrity of all staff working for the returning officer has to be beyond reproach. And whilst you may not actually be involved in campaigning, please have a think about your own views and emotions and especially think about your public and social media profile and the type of content that you, may, that you post online. 
Firstly, some introductions. Barbara Renton is the Council's Interim Chief Executive and the Returning Officer for these elections. I am Scott Walker and I am the Deputy Returning Officer and Election Manager. I'm also delighted to be joined by Christine Grant, our Senior Elections and Community Council Officer, and Pam Rogalski, our Elections and Community Council Officer. Not able to join us today is Sarah Roger, our Legal Advisor, and Alistair Kirkwood, the Electoral Registration Officer from Tayside Valuation Joint Board. So Barbara Renton, as the Returning Officer, is personally responsible for the running of the constituency elections. Steve Grimmond, who is the Chief Executive at Fife Council, is the Regional Returning Officer for Mid Scotland and Fife and is responsible for the collation of results and allocation of regional seats. The Electoral Registration Officer, Alistair Kirkwood, is responsible for maintaining the register of electors and absent voters list. The Electoral Management Board for Scotland have been providing recommendations for all returning officers and they've also been providing supplementary guidance in relation to COVID-19. Your role in this and every election is vital in ensuring that voters have confidence in the election process. It is essential that polling station staff are prepared for and confident about their duties. You are the public interface between the returning officer and the voter. And hopefully this session will help you do your job well on polling day. Specifically tonight, we will provide an overview about this election, outline what we expect you to do on polling day, discuss the voting procedures, think about health and safety issues, including the impact of COVID-19, and highlight a number of administrative arrangements. This presentation, as always, should be used in conjunction with the polling station handbook. The handbooks were sent out at the end of last week, but if you haven't received your copy, it is available online or please contact the elections office and we can make arrangements to get another copy out to you. So the key aims for this election are that all voters have a good experience, that we deliver a professional poll, that we produce accurate results, that the process is as transparent as possible, and that the poll is consistently administered. So to that end, the purpose of this session tonight is to ensure that as far as possible, we all achieve these aims. We also want to provide an overview of the different roles in the polling station so that we all understand each other's individual responsibilities. The Scottish Parliament elections are conducted using the additional member system. Voters will have two ballot papers with one vote on each ballot. Voters will cast one vote for the candidates within the constituency and one vote for the parties or independent candidates on the regional list. The constituency candidate is elected using the first past the post system, which means that he or she who gets the most votes is elected. The regional votes are collated at individual constituency level before being submitted to the regional returning officer who will consolidate the votes before allocating seats using the closed list system. As I said earlier, voters will receive two ballot papers. The lilac one is for the constituency, so in our case, either Perthshire North or Perthshire South and Kenrosshire, and the peach one is for the Mid Scotland and Fife region. Voters need to just simply use an X to mark their preference on each ballot paper. We will work towards the election of one MSP for Perthshire North and one for Perthshire South and Kenrosshire, who are part of the 73 constituency MSPs across Scotland. We are also contributing to the seven MSPs for Mid Scotland and Fife, who are part of 56 regional MSPs across Scotland. On election day, polling will take place across our 124 polling stations in 87 polling places. 65 of the polling stations are in Perthshire North, with the other 59 in Perthshire South and Kenrosshire. The electorate, as of 20th of April, 
was 57,547 in Perthshire North and 63,335 in Perthshire South and North And within those figures are 35,665 postal voters. And the number of postal voters has increased by around 50% in the last three months. Voting, as usual, takes place between 7 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. And at the close of poll, all votes, paperwork and equipment will be returned to the Count Centre at Bell Sports Centre. This is a graphic for the Persia North constituency. It covers six of the Council's 12 wards, Cars of Gowrie, Strathmore, the Gowrie and the Glens, Highland, Strathtay and Perth City Centre. There are five candidates for Perthshire North, Peter Barrett from the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Myrtle Fraser from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Don Marshall from the Scottish Family Party, Ryan Smart from the Scottish Labour Party and John Swinney from the Scottish National Party. The ballot paper is around the size of an A5 bit of paper, so very manageable. Perthshire South and Kenoshire covers the remaining six wards across Perth and Kenos. Strathairn, Strathallan, Kinrosshire, Ammondern, Perth City South and Perth City North. And there are four candidates for Perthshire South and Kinrosshire, Julia Brown from the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Jim Fairley from the Scottish National Party, Janine Rennie from the Scottish Labour Party and Liz Smith from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. And again, the ballot paper is around about the size of an A5 bit of paper. This is a map for the Mid Scotland and Fife region, of which Steve Grimmond, the Chief Executive of Fife Council, is the Regional Returning Officer. Along with our two constituencies of Perthshire North and Perthshire South and Kenoshire, it also takes in the five constituencies in Fife, along with one in Clackmannanshire and one in Stirling. On the regional ballot paper, there are 16 options for the voter. 14 of them are registered parties and there are two independent candidates. All the entries on the regional ballot paper are set out on the slide and I'll pause for a few seconds just to let you have a quick read through. The regional ballot paper is about one and a half times the length of an A4 bit of paper, so it might be a bit more cumbersome to manage and you may have to make more use of the compactors to push them down into the ballot boxes. So just a very quick reminder of how voters can cast their votes in this election. In person, by presenting themselves at your polling station, by post, by proxy or by postal proxy. The deadline for registration for this election was midnight on Monday the 19th of April. Anyone aged 16 or over on 6th of May and who have the right to vote can vote in this election. There are also a number of key dates that absent voters needed to be aware of. If they were applying by post, then they had to register by five o'clock on Tuesday the 6th of April. If they want to vote by proxy, then the deadline is next Tuesday the 27th of April. Notices reflecting alterations are made by the electoral registration officer. And if someone needs an emergency proxy, then the deadline is five o'clock on polling day, Thursday 6th of May. Voting by proxy can only be made on the grounds of a medical emergency or being called away by your job. It is vitally, vitally important that all polling station staff are prepared for and confident about their duties. It is vital that voters have confidence in the election process and that all voters have a good experience with any person who is entitled to vote being able to do so. As I said earlier, the key aims at the election are that the poll is professionally delivered, that we produce accurate results in which all stakeholders can be confident, that the process is transparent and that the poll is consistently administered. It is essential that you act impartially at all times, that you comply with any instructions issued by the returning officer, that you ensure the secrecy and security of the ballot 
and in, in, in the event of any problems, call the elections office immediately. Please do engage with those visiting your polling station, but don't get involved in debates. That's not any of our roles. Within the stations, there will be presiding officers, information officers and poll clerks. Some of the larger polling stations will also have a number one presiding officer too. We also have polling station inspectors deployed across all council wards who will pop in on a number of occasions throughout the day. The election team will be available from around six o'clock in the morning to the close of polls and the contact details will be included within the information pack that's in your ballot box. The election team are still in the process of contacting any presiding officers or poll clerks where there have been any staffing changes since the letters went out. In terms of specific individual responsibilities on election day, the presiding officer will be in charge of proceedings. They will instruct and supervise the work of the poll clerks and account for all the ballot papers, ballot boxes and paperwork. Ahead of the election, of election day, presiding officers should check out contact and access arrangements and please try and make contact with your key holder. Please let the elections team know if you have any problems making contact as soon as possible. Presiding officers must also check out arrangements for ballot box collection and importantly, check the contents of ballot boxes on receipt. Ballot papers should be checked in advance to ensure that they are numbered in sequence and match those pre-printed on the corresponding numbers lists. You should also check the register and absent voting lists are the correct ones for the polling station and that the register contains the expected number of electors for your polling station. Ballot papers also need to be stored securely. It may also seem obvious, but please try and contact the other members of your team. In particular, you should be making contact with your poll clerks. Staffing issues such as sickness should always be referred to the elections teams to manage. Poll clerks and presiding officers must work together to understand their respective roles, including instructing a police officer to remove someone from the polling station, asking the prescribed questions, and limiting the number of accredited observers present at any one time. Again, the duties of the poll clerks are set out in the handbook. Specifically, poll clerks will assist with the layout of the polling station, prepare for the opening of the poll, and check that electors are eligible to vote at that polling station. We have created the role of information officer as part of a response to COVID-19. Information officers have been appointed to almost every polling place. Their primary role is to allow the presiding officer and poll clerk to focus on the voter and the voting process. Their roles are to monitor access to the polling place, and this may include managing voter flow to ensure that as far as possible, physical distancing, distancing of two metres is maintained. They may have to restrict access to ensure compliance, but this may vary from polling place to polling place. They also need to be aware of the number of people in, that, in the place and make sure that there is no prospect of overcrowding. They should also incur, ensure compliance with one-way systems or the keep left principle, ensure compliance with physical distancing and ensure good hygiene around the booth and the ballot box. In order to maintain physical distancing, please don't swap roles throughout the day. And all staff should make sure you know where the polling station is and where you can park if you're driving. And please make sure your contact details are available in case of emergency. As I said earlier, throughout the day, you will get a number of visits from your polling station inspector. The polling station inspectors are there to help you with the smooth running of the election. Their role is to provide a further point of contact throughout the day, to check in with you that things are running smoothly. They can also provide any additional stationery or equipment. And throughout the day, they'll also be collecting any returned postal votes. Please make use of them if you have any issues throughout the day. Make sure you know where you'll be working 
and that you can get to your polling station by 6.20 a.m. Hopefully you've already made your own arrangements for your vote, either postal or proxy. And please make sure you know what you will have to do on polling day. Please read your handbook. Take all your documentation. Don't forget your emergency contact list and please dress appropriately. You are representing the returning officer, so you should dress smartly, but not formally. You have to be comfortable for the day. In addition, some polling stations don't have great heating, so please make sure you have warm clothing. Please also bear in mind that you may have to have windows and doors open to improve ventilation. Don't wear any badges or colours which might suggest affiliation with either a party or a candidate. You won't be able to leave the polling place during the day, so please make sure that you take plenty of food and drink with you. And please make it sure that you have access to a phone. As I said earlier, please try and get to the polling station by 6.20 a.m. The setup of the polling station is vital. If these aspects are addressed from the outside, outset, the day should run smoothly. Layouts and notices can be found in the setup checklist in the polling station handbook. The polling station must work for the voter. Try walking the route the voter will be expected to, vote, to follow. Check all the notices are up. Can people see them? Ensure that the required notice is posted in the polling booth and are pencils ready. And please remember that voters can use their own pens or pencils. There must also be good access to and within the polling station. There must be enough space to turn a wheelchair around inside. And you need to ensure that voting takes place in secret. So please make sure that no booths are overlooked by windows where people outside could see people voting. Prepare your stationery in advance. Arrange the ballot papers in numerical order. Keep your ballot paper books organised to help with issue, and that should also help with the calculations for the ballot paper account at the end of the day. Prepare the register and corresponding numbers list. Also, think of the areas of the polling station where polling agents, including candidates, election agents and observers, can be positioned so that they can oversee proceedings, but not get too close to put voters off or compromise physical distancing requirements. Other supporters and any people who may be campaigning must remain in public places such as the street. They must not impede electors or cause undue influence. Contact the elections office if there are any issues. The ballot box should also be accessible but safe. The presiding officer must be able to see it clearly at all times and voters must pass by it on the route from booths to doors. Health and safety is important for all in the polling station, both staff and voters. Most of this is just common sense. Never put the safety of anyone inside the polling station at risk. Be aware of any potential risks to safety. Inspect your premises regularly and if hazards, hazards are discovered, find a remedy. And if an accident occurs, follow procedures. And please be careful if you need to lift any heavy objects. Call the elections office if you find something you aren't happy about and make use of your polling station inspectors throughout the day. Specifically in relation to COVID-19, I'd now like to turn to the steps that we're taking to deliver a safe election for all stakeholders. We're using guidance from the Election Management Board and learning from other councils who have carried out by-elections recently. We are also able to draw on the learning from the two by-elections we ran in November 2020 and the recent by-election a few weeks ago. This experience has been invaluable in that many of our staff involved in both polling stations and counting have now participated in elections during COVID. In addition, voters in three out of our 12 wards have also been able to participate in local elections and can have confidence in how safe our venues are. We have worked with the Council's corporate health and safety team to develop generic risk assessments and will be working with presiding officers on individual polling places. Physical distancing will be in place across postal votes, in polling stations and at the count. And wherever possible, we will be putting one way systems in place. The appropriate PPE will be distributed to all staff involved 
and masks will be available for voters. In polling stations, we have appointed additional information officers, and as I said earlier, their role will be to manage access, to monitor voter flow and ensure hygiene protocols are in place. It is our intention that the information officers will allow presiding officers and poll clerks to be fully focused on the voter and the voting process. And at the count, we will also be limiting numbers in the venue and we will have COVID marshals in attendance. Turning specifically to the impact of COVID-19 on polling stations, each polling station will be provided with additional equipment to ensure that as far as possible, everyone can stay safe. Specifically, personal protective equipment in the form of gloves and masks will be provided. If a voter hasn't got a mask, they should be offered one, politely, but no action taken if they say no. We can't exclude someone from voting because of this. If someone attends coughing or sweating, it is not your job to diagnose them with COVID-19. They are to vote like anyone else while maintaining distance and hand hygiene. The voter might just have been running for the bus. We don't know why they are coughing or sweating. Pop-up screens will be provided for presiding officers and poll clerks. Tape will also be provided to allow you to mark up physical distancing. Hand sanitizer and wipes will be provided and everyone entering the polling station will be required to sanitise their hands. The wipes should also be used for wiping down surfaces and the ballot box. In our discussions with Health Protection Scotland, they have emphasised that the most important factor, more than wiping down of the surfaces, is that voters sanitise their hands on the way in and the way out of the polling station. The information officers need to point this out to voters. Staff also need to keep their hands regularly sanitised and we will provide ample sanitizer for you. We're also providing a pop up signs with very clear messaging about maintaining physical distancing, using hand sanitizer and wearing face coverings. Wherever possible, please set up a one way system in your polling place so that voters can keep a safe distance from others as they move through the polling place and please encourage them to abide by this. We're also supplying enough pencils so that each voter can get their own pencil which they can keep as a memento, but remember voters can use their own pens or pencils. If possible, you should also open windows and doors to improve ventilation and airflow within your polling place. At the end of the day, the voting experience should be safer than going to the supermarket. These are the pop-up screens that we will be providing. Each presiding officer and poll clerk will receive a clear perspex screen as shown on the left hand side of this slide. Each polling place will also be provided with an information screen which is shown on the right hand side. Both screens are erected by pulling them from the casing and inserting a poll from top to bottom. When you're preparing the ballot boxes, there should be two green seals, two blue seals and a red one and they should be applied like the example on the screen. Two green together, two blue together, and one red one. This is a quick visual check for the staff receiving the boxes at Bell Sports Centre that they have not been tampered with since they left yourself. Totems, as shown on the right hand side, will also be issued for displaying election information. Please check the booths are okay and the correct equipment is available. You might want to block off sections of booths to promote physical distancing. If you want, if you have to use the tactile voting devices or other equipment, please wipe them down after each and every use. So who can enter your polling station? Voters, the returning officer and her staff, candidates and election agents, polling agents, police officers who are on duty, representatives of the Electoral Commission, accredited observers, under 18s accompanying voters and companions of voters with disabilities. Representatives of the media have no right to enter a polling station except as voters or accredited observers. They must not be allowed to film or interview voters in the polling station. Polling station inspectors, the returning officer and the deputy returning officer all have election ID. Observers and Electoral Commission representatives will have photographic ID issued by the Electoral Commission and we'll show you an example of this on a future slide. 
Agents can wear coloured rosettes of a reasonable size, as this actually assists electors by making it clear they are, that they are activists and not electoral officials. The rosette may display the name of a candidate and or an emblem or description. It is OK for campaign groups to campaign on the public highway, but not within the confines of the polling place. These are examples of the types of pass issued by the returning officer to candidates, election agents and polling agents. Each pass includes the name of the pass holder and the capacity in which they are eligible to enter the polling station. Regional candidates will have similar passes. This slide highlights what polling station staff should expect if observers and electoral commission representatives visit the station. Accredited observers and electoral commission representatives will have photographic ID issued by the electoral commission. Accredited observers and commission representatives do not need to give advanced warning of their visit. They can arrive at any polling station at any time. Accredited observers and commission representatives do need to provide you with ID when they come into the station. Silver badges which are issued to accredited observers will have a start and expiry date as well as a reference number above the picture. Please record any visits in the polling station logbook. Observation is an important part of the election process and care should be taken not to obstruct it in any way. However, presiding officers can manage access in cases of overcrowding by, for example, having a rotor system in place. But you're not entitled to bar all observers, only limit numbers present. And if you do have to limit numbers, please record that in the polling station log. This slide summarises who's allowed to vote at the polling station. Those on the electoral register with no letters or dates before their name. Those who are 16 or older. Voters with M or L before their name. If you have any anonymously registered electors in your area, you will be advised separately. Electors registered anonymously will appear without reference to their name or address on the register. Their entry will only consist of their elector number and the letter N. And the polling station quick guide includes all franchise markers. For anonymous electors, we will follow, we follow the procedure set out on the slide. Remember that this procedure is designed to protect people who could be at risk if their name and address were to become available. Other electors appear at the end of the polling list for a polling district. They include anonymous electors, service voters and overseas electors. If the polling list for the polling district is split between a number of stations, it is the last of these stations that will have the other electors on their list. Clerical errors involving additions to the polling list have been identified in the run up to the election. The particulars of the electors affected will appear on a separate sheet of the polling list supplied by the electoral registration officer. On the basis that they are eligible to do so, these voters must be allowed to vote. All poll cards have the polling station numbers displayed on them. If you can't find an entry on the polling list, always check thoroughly before referring the voter to the electoral registration officer. Information from the electoral registration officer on the format of the registers is included in your ballot box. Always check for these exceptions before turning people away or contacting the elections office. If you do need to contact the elections office, we can do a quick search using electronic polling registers. This slide summarises who is not allowed to vote at the polling station. So the following electors must not be given a ballot paper in the polling station. Electors with an A before their name who are postal voters. Electors with an E because they are overseas peers and electors with an F because they are overseas electors. And anyone who is not be 16 years of age until after polling day. Again, the polling station quick guide sets out all of these franchise markers. It may seem like common sense, but voters that feel comfortable with the voting experience are much more likely to participate regularly. Having a positive and empathetic attitude can often help to diffuse difficult situations, but also make sure you do not lead voters to vote in a specific way when offering assistance. The rules must always be followed, and if you're in any doubt, please call the elections office. 
Remember, you are the face of the constituency returning officer on polling day. It is the role of polling station staff to support voters to understand the voting procedure and make it as accessible as possible. The polling station has to work for all voters, including wheelchair users. Stationery provided in alternative languages and formats should be clearly visible to all. You must also be able to provide information to disabled voters on options for voting. The tactile template needs to be clearly visible and you should be confident in using it. All voters must also receive the same level of service. Not all disabled voters will have a visible disability. And Appendix 1 in the polling station handbook looks at some of their quality issues. While physical access is important, it is not the only consideration in ensuring equality. You need to ensure clear access to the building and within the polling station. Disabled voters or those who cannot read or write may ask you for assistance to mark the ballot paper and the presiding officer or a companion can do this. And a companion of a voter with disability must be a close relative, for example, the father, mother, brother, sister, spouse, civil partner, son or daughter, or a qualified elector. A companion can assist no more than two voters and more information on this is included in the polling station handbook. The secrecy of the ballot must be ensured at all times. And a person who is registered as an elector or entered on the list of proxies cannot be refused a ballot paper or in other words, be excluded from voting on the grounds of mental incapacity. Enlarged copies of the ballot paper are available to be taken into the polling booth with a voter to assist in marking the actual ballot paper. They can also be fixed to the wall or notice board for voters to look at before they enter the booth. Ensure that any large print ballot papers, tactile voting templates or magnifying glasses are all visible and available when people enter the station. As I said earlier, please make sure you know how to use the tactile voting device and after you do use it, please wipe it down. Disabled voters or those who cannot read or write may ask you for assistance to mark the ballot paper. And I said, as I said earlier, presiding officers or the companion can do this. But please remember the secrecy of the ballot must be ensured. All staff need to be professional and impartial when talking to voters. If you're asked by a voter how to vote or what to do, you should explain that the top of the ballot paper gives the instructions on how to complete the ballot paper. Some voters may still find the instructions unclear. They may ask, for example, to have their favoured candidate or party pointed out to them or ask where they should mark on the ballot paper. In these circumstances, the presiding officer should read out the instructions printed at the top of the ballot paper and the list of candidates or parties in the order that they appear on the ballot paper. On polling day, you have to remember you're working for the independent returning officer. Only the prescribed questions can be asked if you have a concern about the eligibility of a person who applies for a ballot paper. Sometimes this is referred to as personation. If there is a concern, then ask the prescribed questions and record the event in the polling station log. You must not ask any other questions about their qualification to vote other than the prescribed questions. And more information on this is included in the polling station handbook. But please ask the questions before you issue the ballot paper. So this slide summarises the normal voting process and explains corresponding number lists, unique identifying marks and the official mark. Exceptions are dealt with separately and are covered in more detail in the Commission's polling station handbook. I'll come back to the corresponding numbers lists, which are separate sheets of paper for the elector number to be written on. Remember that poll cards are not required for voting and even if a voter presents it to you, you should still ask them to clarify their name and address. The voter could be at the wrong station. Please make sure nothing is written on the ballot paper other than the voter's intention. The unique identifying mark is another security device and is useful for a court if an election is challenged. The official mark is an example ballot paper that I will show you in a few slides. As I said earlier, poll cards have the polling station number on them and if the voter does pass you the poll card, please hand it back to them immediately with their ballot paper. 
It's important to protect the secrecy of the vote. Make sure voters go to polling booths individually so that the right to a secret vote is protected. No other person is allowed to accompany a voter to a polling booth unless a voter who is disabled or unable to read has requested assistance to vote. And try not to let anyone take selfies or boothies as they become to known. You must protect the secrecy of the ballot. The aim of this slide is to provide a demonstration of how to mark the register consistently and accurately. Please use a ruler to mark the line. Mistakes can be made as a result of poor quality or wobbly lines. Be especially careful to accurately mark the register where there are family members with the same surname. Make sure that the voter has the right poll card for the right election. Always ask for a full name and address unless you're dealing with an anonymous elector even if the elector has handed you their poll card. And please don't score through names. The marked registers need to be legible after the election. Ballot paper numbers will be pre-printed on the corresponding numbers list. So all you need to do is write on the elector number next to the relevant ballot paper number. Don't write the elector number on the ballot paper. And just a reminder that for this election, there are two corresponding numbers lists, one for the constituency vote, which will be on lilac coloured paper, and one for the regional vote, which is on peach coloured paper. So on the left hand side of this slide is an example of the front of the ballot paper for the Pershire North constituency with the five candidates listed. On the right hand side of the slide is the example ballot paper for Pershire South and Kinrosshire with the four candidates. Remember, these are constituency papers, so are therefore lilac coloured. These are examples of the back of the ballot papers and includes the ballot paper number, the unique identifying mark and details of the election. This is the regional ballot paper, which is peach in colour. On the left hand side of the slide, is the front of the ballot paper with the 16 parties and candidates listed. And on the right is the back of the ballot papers with the ballot paper number, the unique identifying marks and details of the contest. So as we explained earlier on, some electors may need to have the voting process explained to them. So if a voter asks you how to vote, read out the instructions on the top of the ballot paper. Voters have one vote on each of their two ballot papers, one for the constituency and one for the region. Voters are asked to put an X on each ballot paper next to their choice. On the constituency ballot paper, they're choosing an individual candidate. On the regional ballot paper, they are choosing either a party or an individual candidate from the regional list. If a voter makes a mistake, simply follow the spoilt vote procedure. And please try not to get into conversations about the elections, the council or anything other than how to vote. Ideally, before the voter places the ballot paper in the ballot box, the voter should fold the ballot paper and show the number and unique identifying mark on the reverse to the presiding officer. Make sure the voter takes care when placing the vote in the, in the ballot box. We had to invite one lady to the opening of the votes in May 2019 because her diamond ring had come off in the box when she voted. So please make use of the compactor and please wipe it down after each use. Tendered ballot papers are different from ordinary ballot papers. They must not be issued to ordinary voters. They are coloured pink and you will only have one book of 20. So when must a tendered vote be issued? If the voter number appears on the polling list or noticed as having already voted. If a proxy's entry on the list of proxies has already been marked and or the entry of the voter who appointed that person as a proxy has been marked. Or when the voter or proxy who appears on the list of postal voters claims not to have applied for a postal vote. In this circumstance, they can obtain a replacement postal ballot pack from the returning officer up until 10 p.m but can be issued with a tendered ballot paper at any time if they so wish. So what's the procedure? Before issuing a tendered vote, the number one PO should be consulted and if you're unsure, contact the election office. 
The presiding officer must write the voter's elector number with the polling district reference on the tendered votes list against the number on the tendered ballot paper being issued. Then they must check the tendered ballot paper bears the official mark, fold it, unfold it and hand it to the voter. The voter must then vote in secret, fold the ballot paper and return it to the presiding officer. It's really important, but the tendered ballot paper must not be placed in the ballot box. You, sh you should take it from the voter without unfolding it, write the name of the voter and the elector number with the polling district reference on the back and then place it in the official envelope provided. Enter the voter's elector number and name on the list of tendered votes. If the voter is a proxy, the presiding officer must endorse the tender ballot paper with the proxy's name, but with the voter's elector number. And then enter that number and the name of the proxy on the list of tendered votes. Throughout the day, you may also receive completed postal vote packs that are handed in, and these must be placed in the packet for postal votes handed in at the polling station. Please store them securely in the envelope provided and they will be uplifted throughout the day by polling station inspectors. At the end of the day, the packet must be sealed at the close of poll and any not collected will be returned with the ballot box at the close of poll, but please make sure they stay in the envelope and not, are not put into the ballot boxes. It is rare for there to be queues to vote at 10 p.m. But if someone has arrived at the polling station in time, it is their right to cast their vote. If there are lengthy queues at any point in the day, particularly in the last couple of hours before the close of poll, you should contact the election office to discuss the situation and agree how to deal with it. It is important that you're aware of your obligations to voters waiting to vote at 10 p.m. and of how to deal with your responsibilities. Please watch for a queue forming and you must make sure that everyone waiting at 10 o'clock can cast their vote. Hand them a queue card and don't allow anyone to join the queue after 10 p.m. You can check if anyone queuing is there to hand in a postal vote, and if they are, they can be called forward to reduce the queue. As I said earlier, if queuing looks to be a problem, please advise the election office as soon as possible. I showed you an image earlier of how to apply the seals to the ballot box. Agents are also entitled to add their own seals and they are, they're also entitled to remain to see the close of poll procedures, but please try and discourage them from using their own padlocks. Take time to complete the ballot paper account and make sure this is done accurately, otherwise it will cause problems at the count. Please also take time to ensure that all documents are placed in the correct packets and signed as appropriate. Presiding officers will also note the arrangements for delivery of the boxes to the count. Please note that everything should be returned with the drivers apart from the polling booths. That means the ballot boxes, stationery, PPE and screens should all be sent back with the driver at the close of poll for delivery back to Bell Sports Centre. When all the paperwork is completed and everything is packed, the box, blue sack, orange pouch, PPE and screens should be returned to your designated pickup point or wait for your driver. As usual, the orange pouch should contain the ballot paper account envelope and postal ballot papers handed into the polling station envelope if they were not collected by your polling station inspector. The blue sack should contain the marked copy of the register and list of proxies envelope, the corresponding numbers list, the list of votes marked, the list of tender votes envelope, all tendered pink ballot papers which have, which have been used or not spoilt, the unused and spoilt ballot papers and ballot paper stubs envelopes, the polling station log shown as absent voters and registered error report envelope, and poll cards which have been handed in, the travel expense claim form envelope, and all other stationery and notices. The, secrecy, the secret of the paperwork is to start early when it's quieter, rather than leave it to the close of poll when there are so many other things to do. This is a really useful graphic of what goes where and it's included within your information packs. And in an attempt to become more environmentally friendly, we've moved away from using plastic envelopes and have instead provided paper versions. So very briefly, the last opening of postal votes will take place at the close of poll at 10 p.m. 
The count will take place in Bell Sports Centre starting at 9am on Friday the 7th of May, where the verification of unused, tendered, spoilt ballot papers will take place followed by the actual count. And we'll be dealing with Perthshire North on, on the Friday the 7th and Perthshire South and Kinrosshire on Saturday the 8th. And as usual, results will be published on the Council's website. These are some of the references that you may find useful and they will be included within the slides when we send them out. These are our contact details. We are all working from home, but the elections office phone number and email address is covered as usual. So please make contact if you need anything. Finally, the Electoral Commission plan to issue a survey to polling station staff in order to gather feedback about the experiences on polling day, particularly in relation to the challenge posed by the pandemic. They plan for the survey to be available to be completed online and are going to confirm further details as soon as possible. They're considering providing a scannable QR code which would allow the survey to complete, be completed using a smartphone. When we have more information on this, we will send it out. Finally, any questions? So I've not been seeing the chat throughout because of my, my screen that's been presenting, but I'm hoping questions have been dealt with throughout the session. Can somebody confirm that? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's been there's quite been a few questions, questions that have been dealt with, with thought, thought, thought there, there are, are probably, probably a couple, couple that, that we would just, just clarify. Okay, okay, so, so there's, there's questions, questions about, about whether the polling booths and the screens will be set up in advance the day before. So I think that's um, they will be they're delivered on the Tuesday um, and I think Christine will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it depends if you're able to get access to some some venues let you in the night before I understand, but some don't. Is that correct Christine? Yes, if you contact the halls they'll they'll let you know if you can get access in the night before or not. Um, there was a question in relation to um, the, sorry, I'm just looking, somebody was just saying about how the screens will be set up, you know, sort of they don't look very wide. Um, will they be sharing the same screen or do they have one each? So each presiding officer and poll clerk has their own screen. They're about two metres high and they're about 60 centimetres wide, so they're, they're they're enough to protect you from some or protect you from somebody in front of you. I should have also said, please don't cut holes in them. Um, some came back last time with holes in them, so please try and protect our screens. OK, I'm just looking through the questions. Um, what information are polling agents entitled to receive from the polling staff? So I understand uh, from previous elections, they've been told turnouts and all that sort of thing from local stations. OK, so they're permitted to give that information to polling agents. So, yeah, that has been the case yeah. in previous, yeah. previous elections, yeah. Um, the I think there's a number of questions, Scott, in relation to you know sort of the number of people who should be in a polling station at any one point, a polling place at any one point. Um, I think that you know sort of that is very much you know sort of the the decision of the presiding officer. Um, Absolutely, um, and that was one of the one of the points that was made at one of the previous by elections. We provided um, blank signs so that each individual presiding officer who knows their venue best can decide how many people can be in safely because the, the, the idea came from a presiding officer and it basically the principle was that having a sign up even though it's handwritten would just give you a little bit more power to your elbow to say you know if the number's four then that's the number that are allowed in and hopefully it'll be a day like this so there'll be no issues with people hanging about in the sun outside. 
but we're, we're sending out a lot of, you know, sort of media and um, social media about, you know, sort of people spacing their, their visits, not all going at necessarily the traditional times of um, first thing in the morning, at, you know, sort of and in the evening. So hopefully that will minimise um, the amount of traffic at any one point. <clears throat> I'm just checking. Uh, there's a, a, a question. There was a follow. There was a, an initial question in relation to um, contact tracing and the you know sort of recording people who were visiting the um, polling station. Um, and the follow up question to that was: Could this? Could that? Um, list be kept by the information officer? So there's no requirement for contact tracing because the voter should be in for less than 50 minutes. So that's the advice we were given for the by-elections. In terms of the accredited observers or the electoral commission representatives, their attendance should be recorded on the on the polling station log and that will include your know, times of when they're there and how long they're there for. So that would be the, the information we would use if we had to um, get back in touch with my guess if there was an, an issue. But the polling station log is more than just those visitors, so it's really the presiding officer that should be keeping an eye on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just looking through. Um, there was a question about, you know, sort of the provision of masks for voters. So each uh, within each venue, we're providing a box of PPE, which will have a box of gloves, a box of mat, more, some of them have more than one box of masks. So they are available for voters if required. And it's the standard medical ones for anybody that's been to the vaccination centres, that's that type that are being issued there. Okay, uh, I'm just and Going through them, Scott. Um, a question about will the hall janitor be able to help with measuring and laying out the, the tape in terms of social distance measures? I guess that's down to each individual, individual venue. I mean, we're taking on with the higher of the hall. I I don't know if janitors or caretakers hang about at that time. Um, it will probably be presiding officers will have a better knowledge of what the usual arrangements are um, than us. Um, and I would suggest that when you make contact with your venues, that you maybe ask that question about whether they'll be about to just give you a help. OK, and a further linked question. Are we getting one way arrows taped to set out route, entrance and exit signs? And are we setting this out ourselves or by others? Um, and a question about COVID marshals, you know, sort of information officers at every venue, almost every venue, but not the particularly smaller ones. Yeah, almost every venue. Um, there is tape, so there's yellow and black tape will be provided in your ballot box to mark things out. Not arrows um, because we don't know what each venue needs, um, but the tape will definitely be available for you to mark the physical distancing. You might also find that a lot of the venues have got procedures in place as well already as they prepare to open up. Um, a question about you know sort of um, first time poll clerk, the presiding officer will go through th things before the polls open. Sorry, I missed that, Barbara. Sorry, I'm muttering. Um, uh, <laughs> nothing unusual there. As a first time poll clerk, I'm assuming the pres presiding officer will go through things before the polls open. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a lot of experienced presiding officers who will be able to to help them any new poll clerks. Okay. If the um, screens are solid, how can you hand the ballot papers over? So what we're asking people to do is reach around the side as you hand the ballot paper. Um, yeah, reach reach around the side, please. OK, um, and a couple of questions about the tactile equipment. The tactile template. Oh, sorry, so I, I, what are the questions? 
No, it's just you know sort of uh, what does it look like? We normally have one to show people. Oh, OK. Um, so if I is, is my screen still on? Yes. OK, so if I skip back. I'll try and skip back. on sorry too far so that's uh, on the right hand side of the right hand photo is the tactile device and basically that, that's it provides assistance to people with visual issues um, as to how they vote. So it comes there, there's various ones. Obviously, this is a Scottish Parliament election, so that's the one that will be included within your ballot box that's sent out um, a week on Wednesday for the Thursday. And presumably most people who need to use it would know how to use it, Scott. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully, presiding officers um, have got good experience of using it in the past. Um, I think it's a case of opening it up, and it's got basically got big tabs about how you um, how you show where bits are, bits of the ballot paper, are, etc. Okay. But yeah, that's one of the downsides to doing it this way. Unfortunately, we can't. Yeah. Give live so, demonstrations. Um, there are a number of um questions from um, staff who are asking um, whether they can still vote. I'll, I'll find one uh, at their, you know, sort of if they are working at that particular polling place, they can still vote at that polling place. I think there seems to be a little bit of confusion from something that you may or may not have said, Scott. OK, so if a member of staff is due to vote at the the station they're working at, yes, they are entitled to vote. OK. Are there separate ballot boxes for constituency regional votes? Yes, so there's two ballot boxes for each polling station. The lilac paperwork is to do with the constituency and that will be the colour that's on the outside of the um, ballot box and the peach is for the regional ballot box. And again, that will be on the outside of that box. Please try and um, make sure voters use the right ones because that can cause problems at the count when we come to verify the number of votes. Um, also mentioned of a COVID marshal. Um, is that another person that will be at the polling station? No, so the COVID marshals will be at the count. Um, I was just trying to give you a, a general awareness of the type of things we're having to do um, for all of our different elements of the election. So the COVID, excuse me, the COVID marshals will be at the count on the Friday and Saturday. OK, so is the information um, officers at each polling station who will be polling place who will be the, yep. supporting the, the COVID arrangements? Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone asking whose responsibility it is to check and allow access um, for the accredit observers is it the information officer can the accredited observer walk straight in or will they have to join the queue and who logs the visit so the presiding officer should log the visit in the in the log book um i think it'd be quite rude if they jumped the queue but um no i think they should they should they should maintain physical distancing they should because if, they, if they're going to jump the queue, that's going to breach that. So they should just file in in the queue if there is one at that time. So no, they shouldn't jump the queue. OK, um, some questions about cleaning the um, polling booths after every um, voter. So it's not essential. Um, as we said, the, the key is people sanitising their hands before they enter and after they and when they leave. And that should negate the, necess the, the necessity for clean down all, all the time. I think it needs to be done. I think some people are doing it sort of every 15 minutes um, and during the by-elections, but no, it doesn't have to be done after every single one. As long as people are sanitising their hands on the way in, that's the most important thing for the hygiene. OK, um, and there has been a couple of questions again. I think Scotland, something you said about what documentation are poll clerks required to have with them? 
So the I think I said take your documentation. I think that's just your appointment letter, um, etc. Christine, is that what? Sorry, I was answering questions there. What was the question? About uh, paperwork, the documentation. I think one of the slides we say, please ensure you have your documentation. That would just be your appointment letter, etc. Yes. OK, um, somebody asking any guidance on the one way system to still get to the ballot box in a station with multiple poll stations. So again, that's um, that's why we think the presiding officer are our best place that you, you know your venues best and how you can lay out um, the boxes. Um, we have reduced the number of boxes in a number of stations, so there should hopefully be a lot more room to allow you to do that. Um, I was at Oak Bank um, for the by elections in November. And basically they were keeping them as far apart as possible so that there was a one way system on either side and then you left the building at the same it, it, you know you came to the out of the same place but um hopefully because we've taken out these boxes there'll be more opportunity for physical distancing and one way systems okay um, someone asking about why we're not provided with either handheld or fixed temperature monitors to assist with COVID access. So thermometer temperatures is not something that's been um, advised to us by public health. It's about hand hygiene, it's about masks, it's about physical distancing. The thermometer, the temperatures is not something that has come across um, the election world in any of the by-elections last year, this year, or through the EMB guidance um, this year. Okay, someone asking about a payment for the training, I'm assuming. So the payments are included in your um, larger fee for the day. Um, it's assumed you will be here and therefore you get the full amount that's stated in your in your appointment letter. Okay, and um, if someone questions why we allow a person in who's not wearing a mask, what should we tell them? Um, there's, no, there's nothing in the legislation that means we can stop them. Um, as we said in the presentation, it's about making sure that person does their hands, but also about making sure that you wipe down after that person has left. Um, that's the crucial thing. It's about the sanitising and it's about the hand hygiene. And it's just about getting that person through as soon as, as quickly as possible. OK. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of in terms of uh, how the polling station has uh, is um, set up, then your polling station inspector will be able to assist with that on their visit. You know, sort of just, you know, sort of anything that you're not sure about when they visit as early as they can, then you'll be able to discuss any concerns that you've got with them too. Absolutely. And then um, hopefully the polling station inspector can share good ideas across his or her patch because um, mm -hmm. you know, they're the person that's seeing a number of polling stations. So if there's some good ideas out there, we can get them across um, to other stations um, through them. Okay. And, sorry, and the polling station inspectors are all quite experienced. So again, they've been involved in a number of elections. Some of them were involved back in the previous by-elections. So again, we can use that, use their experience in learning. Um, are we handing out the pencils with the ballot papers? They will be beside the presiding officer and I would suggest that the um, voter helps himself to the pencil. OK, but no strings, no pencils on strings in the ballot. No, no, no it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a keepsake. It's a mm -hmm. memento of taking part in the Scottish Parliament elections 2021, a free pencil. OK, I'm looking um, through the questions. I don't know if there's anyone who's got who's asked a question who ha feels that they haven't answered it, if they want to put it back into the chat, because that will show up at the end and make sure that we've actually covered that for you. 
I was also going to say, Barbara, if anybody does have any questions that come after it, please get in touch and we can uh, get back to you because um, there was a lot of information obviously in the presentation. Once you've had a chance to look at your polling station handbook as well, things might come out. Please get in touch with us and we can um, help you. Um, if someone is concerned about the safety of let, uh, us letting someone in without a mask, would it be appropriate to suggest they wait outside until that person has left before they enter? Sorry, what was, sorry, what was that? One? I think it's just you know sort of if 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 someone waiting to come in knows that there is no there is already someone in who isn't wearing a mask, would it be appropriate to suggest that they wait outside until that person has left before they enter? I think it's a very good idea. It, it gives the it lets the person decide when it's safe for them to enter. Um, so yeah, that's a that's an excellent idea. So they they're when they enter when they're comfortable to do so. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, still a couple of questions around about face masks for um, our staff working about material face masks or the medical ones that we will be or the ones that we will be supplying. Um, and if they are behind screens, do they need to wear masks? So in terms of the material ones, um, I think that's personal choice. Um, at the count, we're insisting on staff wearing a particular type of mask. But because you've got the screens um, and you're sitting down and you, you should be a distance enough away from the person, you're probably OK with your material masks. Um, in terms of taking the masks off, um, Ruth Turner will probably chip in here when she sees, but I think that's OK if you're sitting down because you've got the screen, because you're not, because the person sitting alongside you is not looking directly at you, there is less risk. Obviously, best practice would be to keep them on um, for as long as possible and to keep them fresh, but um, I think it's OK to take them off when you're sitting down. But when you're moving about, you definitely have to wear, have a mask on. Someone asking if it's possible to get a copy of the slides. Uh, yes. Uh, I think we can do that um, or if not, we can get the Adam and audio keep you right, but I think the presentation will be going on YouTube um, in the next day or so. So I, I don't know what people, what would people search for? <laughs> um, yeah, OK, well, well, we'll get something out to you to, to let you know where it is, um, etc. Okay. It, it, sorry, sorry, it might even be that we put the presentation on the website that you use to get into this um, and that would be a way of you accessing the slides at your at your leisure. OK, um, and someone asking again about the contact tracing as it's definitely asked for in the handbook. OK, um, so the contact tracing, I say the advice we've been given is that it is uh, 15 minutes is the magic number. And so that's why we don't need to keep register for our voters because they should be in over a matter of minutes. We'll be using the polling station log if, if an issue comes out and that's what we would use for contact tracing. Um, and people say, and what do we do if we've not received a polling station handbook? OK, well, if you can get in touch with the elections office, we can get them out to you. Um, we did send a batch out, last, well, we sent them all out, we think, last um, week, but the post office is probably quite busy. So if you've not got it, you can get it online or we can get another version out to you. OK, presiding officer is in charge of the building who's just responsible for the information officer. Well, it's a, it's a team, team effort. I mean, the presiding officer is in charge of the uh, the voting process, the information officers in charge of the sort of voter flow. I'm hoping that um, you can work as a team um, to ensure that the you know it's a good experience for the voter. Yeah. Um, and then there are a couple of people who are saying that they're exempt from wearing um, masks for medical reasons and hoping that that's not an issue, particularly for the team that they're working with. So again, we, we hope we've got the other the, the mitigation measures in place with the screens and the distancing that will allow that to, to be OK. 
But um, yeah, I, I, I would suggest that if you've got the, the, the medical lanyards or the, the sunflowers to display that, you might want to have those just as a as one of the the, the, the reason you've not got it on. Okay. Um, do you have to eat at your desk? Um, hopefully there'll be a gap in proceedings that allow you to step up, get a stretch of the legs, um, to, to get something to eat to eat. Um, so no, you don't think you have to eat at your desk. Um, and is there a map available anywhere to show the areas covered by each polling station? Uh, Christine, is that available? Sorry, what was the question? Is there a map available to show the polling districts? Is it? Uh, we do have a map, yes. Is that on the website? It is available on the website or I can add it to the elections page. OK, um, that might be the way to do it. Let but it's, do it would be very hard to read it because for the whole of the area and all the different polling districts. OK, well, we can maybe put it on if, it, if it's useful, it's not and somebody can come back to us and tell us what they were looking for. OK. Um, can you clarify, and this is a specific question about one of the slides, um, page 19, I think it's if an elector refuses a particular ballot paper before it is handed over. If so whether it's page 19 of your slides or page 19 of the handbook. Um, No, it must be the handbook. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can refute. I don't think you can pick what ballot paper you get. I mean, they come in order. That that's part of the audit of the whole vote and process. So, the, a voter sorry, can I come in there, Scott? Yeah, so, yeah. what happened before um, at the last Scottish Parliament? If a voter refuses one of their votes, what they were, what staff were asked to do was give them their votes if they don't wish to use that ballot paper it's up to them to spoil it and put it in the ballot box or if they totally refuse it you cancel that ballot paper and um, so that your numbers run sequential throughout your CNL list and that will go into your your cancelled postal the envelope for cancelled votes as though you're spoiling a vote but, but they can't get but they can't get another vote can they no, well, they can. If they come back and say they've changed their mind, then yes, you do the process again. And for okay. the other vote that they're not getting, you do the cancelled process for that. OK. But I think, it but just keeps your numbers sequential. Otherwise, uh, yeah. it'll get confusing. But I don't think they can cherry pick their favourite number. No. And are there two corresponding number lists, one for each paper or just one for both? No, there are two corresponding number lists, um, one peach, one lilac, and that, sorry, purple, and that corresponds with the regional and the constituency votes. Everything should be colour coded, so if it's purple, it's constituency, if it's peach, it's regional. Um, and a further question about the role of the COVID marshal as opposed to the information officer. So the COVID marshal will be um, in Bell, the COVID marshals will be in Bell Sports Centre. Um, there will be a lot more people in Bell Sports Centre and from our experiences of, of the by-election counts, some of the election agents tend to get quite excited about things and tend to uh, get quite close together. So their key role will be to maintain, be keeping people apart in terms of physical distancing. And there's four of them. I think we've got four each day because potentially we could have up to 200 people in that building. Um, it still complies with the, the, the limits for that building. But if they all start merging in with each other, the marshals will be expected to separate them. OK, I think that looks like all the questions that I can see, Scott. OK, thank you, Barbara. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming along tonight. Um, we hope you found it useful. I said earlier, if there are any other questions that come to mind um, once you've had another look at the presentation or been through the handbook, please uh, drop us an email and we'll, we'll do our very best to get back to you um, with a response. Um, the last thing I want to say was uh, thank you for thank you for being here tonight and thanks for your support um, for these elections. 
and we couldn't do it without you um, and we hope you uh, you enjoy your role. So thank you for tonight.